Our keynote speaker this morning was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in both 2012 and 2018, and awarding the, awarded the Outstanding Chef and Humanitarian of the Year by the James Beard Foundation. Jose Andres is an internationally recognized culinary innovator, New York Times bestselling author, educator, television personality, humanitarian, and chef owner of Think Food Group. A pioneer of Spanish tapas in the United States, he is also known for his groundbreaking avant-garde cuisine and his award-winning group of more than 30 restaurants located throughout the country and beyond, ranging in a variety of culinary experiences from food truck to his multi-location, vegetable-focused, fast-casual beef steak to world-class tasting menus like Mini Bar by Jose Andres and Simone and have both earned two Michelin stars. Chef Andres is the only chef globally that has both two-star Michelin restaurants and four bib gourmand. As naturalized citizen originally from Spain, Chef Andres has been a tireless advocate for immigration reform. In 2010, he formed the World Central Kitchen, a nonprofit that provides smart solutions to end hunger and poverty by using the power of food to empower communities and to strengthen economies. Nobly, his team served over 3.6 million meals to the people of Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria an experience about which he wrote in his best-selling book, We Fed an Island, the true story of rebuilding Puerto Rico one meal at a time. I agree. <laughs> Chef Andres has earned numerous awards, including the 2015 National Humanitarians Award, sitting down with Chef Andres this morning is Rita Fraser, President of the National Association of Farm Broadcasting. Rita has been Director of Network and Audio Services for RFD Radio Network and the Illinois Farm Bureau since January of 2015. As a full-time farm bro broadcaster in Bloomington, Illinois, Rita works to produce and distribute more than a dozen programs each weekday, bringing the latest agriculture news to Midwest producers. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you. Chef, good morning. Good morning. How are you, everybody? Hola. <laughs> wow, you're awake. I, I didn't have my first margarita yet, so I'm sleepy. Can you tell us uh, maybe something that we didn't hear in your bio? Uh, what drove you to become a chef? Um, well, frankly, I, I call myself a cook. Uh, chef is a word I, I don't really get it. Um, I cook, it's what I do. I get food and I cook. And people keep calling me chef and I don't know why. Um, because in my house, chef on paper, you're in control. And in my house, I am in control with permission of my wife and my three daughters. <laughs> so I am a cook, a humble cook, and I'm happy. But um, uh, you know, we, we, we all have our stories. We all have our life. And, and every life is as important as the next one, our experiences, who we are. And I do believe we are who we are thanks to the people we have around us. Uh, I don't know if it's because I'm becoming 50 and I don't see myself as a millennial anymore, but that was a joke. But, 
But I began looking at the past, right? And sometimes I began remembering people that I forgot, but that they were super important in my life. And sometimes I didn't realize at the time, but I realized 30 years later that maybe I am who I am thanks to those people being part of my life. So for me, very quickly, um, um, you know, I, I, uh, I always tell the story of my dad, my mom. They were nurses. I always saw the work that people like them did in the hospitals, sometimes beyond duty. Uh, everyday heroes that sometimes they don't get any recognition, but that they are the ones who make the DNA of who we are one, one good act of kindness at a time. And my father was very much the one that really inspired me to cook. And he would make paella. Paella is this very large uh, pan that looks like a UFO. Uh, and I have many sizes from five people to 5,000 people. And it's usually you make a rice dish, even you can use the pan for anything else you want, chili if you want. And my father will always put me in charge of making the fire. He'll send me to the forest to grab any wood that was down the little springs and, and I'll make the fire. But one day I got tired. I said, Daddy, I've been making the fire for so many years. Let me uh, do the cooking. And he didn't let me. I got very upset and he sent me away. He fed everybody anyway. And he got me on the side after everybody ate. And he told me, my son, I know you wanted to do the cooking, but actually I needed you to do the fire. Everybody's only thinking about the cooking, about the steering the pot, but the most important thing is making the fire, is controlling the fire, is learning your fire. Find your fire, understand the fire, and then you can do any cooking you want in your life. This for a cook is a very direct message, but this is a great metaphor of life itself. Let's learn your fire, uh, and then just cook life. That's, that's something that was very important for me when I was young, and I didn't realize after later on the power that those words from my dad had in me. And that's what I've been doing ever since. With that said, what are you proudest of to date? Proudest of? Uh, well, I have a wife and three daughters I don't deserve. I'm very proud that lately people understand my English more often than not. In the old days, uh, I w after I will speak for half an hour, they will tell me, what did you say? Like, <laughs> now you are. My daughters will tell me, Daddy, when you come to school, please don't speak English to us. I speak Spanish and we will translate. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, uh, a Spanish dad with three American-born daughters, that was hard. But I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud. I know where I come from. Uh, everybody that follows me a little bit knows the love I have for Spain, the country I was born. But everybody that follows me a little bit, they see the love I have to the country I belong now. So one of very important moments for my wife and I and my children was when we became American citizens five years ago, and we are very proud of that. Uh, and, and let me tell you, last year, you, uh, you talk about the American, the American dream. Yeah, it's a lot of people that sometimes we don't feel they are experiencing the American dream, but still, I believe in the American dream. And 30 years ago, I was in the Spanish Navy. First time I came to America was in the Spanish Navy. I was in a training ship for the midshipmen, sailing ship, four mast, beautiful white boat, 32 cells, and we came to Pensacola, uh, Florida, and then to New York, Burrasano Bridge, uh, Lady Liberty, Ellis Island, and we docked on 30th Street on the west side on Manhattan. 30 years later, I opened a big restaurant on 30th Street, 100 meters away from where I dock as a young sailor. If you talk about dreams, sometimes that happens. I'm very proud of that, too. But you know what I'm very proud of? So last week, we reached 3 million meals in Bahamas. Dorian hit Bahamas as nobody could believe what happened there. Uh, it's like if the entire state of California and Florida, everybody lost their homes. It was more than 80,000 people of Bahamas, 
in Abaco and Grand Bahamas plus 12K is that they lost everything they had. Almost 17% of the country lost their homes. You see how massive that was? Uh, a team of chefs uh, uh, like me, we landed there even when the hurricane was still up in Grand Bahama. Uh, we reached 80,000 meals a day in less than seven days. We did 45 medical evacuations. We got water fil filtration systems from solar uh, for the salination using solar. We did millions of water or gallons of water. Um, um, we built a dock. 22,000 solar lights were distributed all across the islands. At the end of the day, again, as I said before, a group of men and women, which at the end we were a 4,000 strong army, we were able to feed 3 million meals in the last uh, few months. That's what I'm super proud of, that when we can, we can do anything happen. So how did you start those efforts? How did you gather those 4,000 people? How did you do that? Uh, well, uh, uh, Bahamas was uh, very clear. We arrived to the islands and we were the only people there. We arrived 12 days before UN, we arrived. Uh, we're quick, I can, cooks were very quick. You know why we are very quick? Because if not you go and you go and yelp and you bitch about it. <laughs> and you have your right to do that. So when you are hungry and when you are thirsty, you are thirsty and hungry today, no week from now. In, in the restaurant business, that's clear. If you don't get your salad in five minutes, they're like, hello, it's a Caesar salad, man. <laughs> but what happens in an emergency, we try to take care of the people in the same way we will take care of them in our private restaurants. Especially when people are voiceless and people are in disrepair. We try to treat them as they are paying customers because they don't deserve anything less. So when a group of chefs, we come with the idea of we're gonna feed you as soon as we can, this becomes very powerful. We don't plan, we don't meet, we only have one thing. Anybody's hungry gets a plate of food, anybody's thirsty gets a bottle of water. And from there we are able to use, to start a simple, uh, a big problem, transform into a very simple solution. Sometimes the biggest problems we face, and I know we face many, and you are trying to resolve many of them, like we all are, and that's great, Sometimes the biggest problems, they have very simple solutions. Sometimes I say less talking, less planning, and more doing. Because in the process of being with boots on the ground and doing, the solution to the problems show up. If you keep meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting, the problems are there and nobody's doing a thing about solving them. Because if you fail, because if you fail in the process, it's fine, it's one thing you know that you didn't know before, so you can have a better idea next time. And that's the way we believe in. Boots on the ground and make it happen. It's wonderful. You do hold uh, a lot of the same qualities as these people in the audience. So conservation, very important to them, very important to you. Tell us about your link to conservation, water quality, et cetera. Well, I mean, chefs, we need to be careful because we, we are not saints, you know. Think about it, I mean, we kill things, well, we don't kill them, the farmers do for us, or the, no, but it's the truth, we are not, you know, if it's anybody from PETA here, I know I'm not their best friend. <laughs> but I do respect them, because respect is the, the biggest thing I learned in America, that America respects each other like no other country I ever saw before, and respect is what we need to be, even those don't think like us. And for me, you say, I learned that, you know, Sometimes you are like, you are in a conference about saving the ocean, but then in your restaurant you have tuna specials. <laughs> you are like, yeah, right, that's a big bullshit. Uh, yeah. And you are about, yeah, let's just stop putting CO2 in the environment and then we are bringing our pineapples from Hawaii, you know, because they are the best pineapples. And you are like, yeah. Fox CO2. And at the end, what we need to be is very pragmatic and very conscious. And use whatever we preach, we need to live by those words. 
We cannot use half a speech in one side and then do something completely different in the other. Because if not, we are confusing who we are and what we do. Uh, chefs like me, we are, away, we are far away from perfection in, in being, but I believe that we've been more and more aware. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I used to serve shark fin in my restaurant. Why? Because in my country, it was a tradition. We're not the typical sharks that we understand. They are tiny sharks. They multiply a lot in that part of Spain, but nonetheless, people don't know they're sharks. And I took shark out of my menu 20 years ago precisely because I love scuba diving, I love to be in the ocean, and I'm every single day trying to find sharks. And for me, when I realized the impact you could have used by designing one day, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna say I care about the world I live in. I'm gonna do something that shows I really care about the world I live in. The day I took shark out of the menu, uh, for me was a very big day because it showed that really we were committed to have a little impact on that. Um, uh, we did things like, um, anybody has heard about the monarch butterflies? Many of you probably, you want to have monarch butterflies in your lands, in your farms, in your, it's a good sign when you learn that having monarch butterflies that succeed and breed and it's a big thing. For me, I went to Mexico many years ago with my family to visit the heart of Michoacan. The monarch butterflies migrate every year and they spend the winter in this part of Mexico. And you can go to this forest and you will find millions and millions of butterflies. These butterflies have been in danger for quite some time. And the population is slowly, but surely it's been going down because the wheat milk, whatever is the plants that they need to feed themselves, they've been going down in numbers all across Canada and North America. So every time it's less and less butterflies that go every winter to this part of Michoacan. I opened a restaurant called Oyamel. Oyamel is the name of the forest where these butterflies span every winter. And I, we began trying to support the different conservation groups that they were trying to protect the habitats of the monarch butterflies, not only in Mexico, but all Canada and United States. Why this is important? Because when we see that something so simple as a butterfly, so fragile, is not gonna make it. If we don't make big changes in the way we farm, in the way we handle livestock, et cetera, et cetera, in the way we produce cars, in the way we produce energy. And at the end, the wall I wanna live in is a, a wall with butterflies where my daughters were there on their hand and the butterflies will get on their hands, hundreds of them. And you see that moment of my daughter with the butterflies and I see that's the future. And I only see that future of my daughters with those same butterflies on their hand and I see that's not the future I wanna leave to my daughters. For me, it was very important that we began doing use this one taco, that the money we raise on the taco will keep going to these conservation groups of the monarch butterfly. At the end, in a very crazy, indirect way, a little restaurant in the heart of DC became the place to send the message to senators and congressmen that yes, a simple butterfly that has nobody to, has the support of nobody, because I don't know that butterflies can have a lobby, um, I wish they did, but they don't. So it's up to every one of us to give voice to those things in nature that are voiceless. And just for me to see that we had one taco that we could be sending such a strong message in a city that, you know, everybody tells me, Jose, you are so lucky that you feed congressmen and senators. I'm like, thanks God, because if not, wouldn't be anybody else in DC. It's the only people around are politicians. For me, use that the politician will find out through a taco special telling the story of the monarch butterflies and why they may be so important for the future we want all to live in, just began giving me a sense of every mo moment counts. I want people to come to my restaurant and just have a good time and don't have to think about anything else, but it's very important that in the way we eat, we think about how we eat, because this can change the future in so many ways. If we are conscious about the way we feed ourselves, we feed our families, and we feed our country, America can be a much better place and so the world can be a much better place. So this is little ways that uh, we've been always doing, trying to put uh, conservation really where it deserves to be, very high up in the way we live.
You're, you're so passionate about what you're doing and you referenced your help in uh, helping out in disasters, hurricane recovery, feeding those in need. How did you um, keep from getting way over uh, emotional? In other words, connecting with these people. I'm sure it was emotionally draining as well as gratifying. Oh yeah, I, we all do get emotional, right? Emotion is something we should all show up. It's okay, especially if you are a man. It's okay to cry. Yeah, it's okay to cry. We need to stop showing like, oh, the men, we are the, the hard ones and we don't cry. No, I want to cry. I, and I, when I cry, I cry. I, you know what I think we need to do? We need to talk about weapons. I mean, I'm the best shooter in the history. I've never missed a shot. <laughs> but, but different type of weapon now. We need to weaponize empathy. We need to start weaponizing the good things. So when I go to give, when the hurricanes in North Carolina, in Florida, the floodings in Nebraska, the fires in California, the volcano in Guatemala and Hawaii, the earthquake in Puerto Rico and Albania, the fires in Australia, we are there. And we are there with a very simple message, we care. And a plate of food, I hope, is the beginning of a better tomorrow. So it's okay to cry, and I do cry often. I was crying when in Puerto Rico we were leaving people thirsty. And I was crying when in Puerto Rico, American citizens in, in Puerto Rico, uh, elderly, were dying because they didn't have generators. But the issue is that we had the generators, but we didn't have anybody to distribute them. That's why in Bahamas we were distributing generators right and left. Why? Because we know how important it may be for elderly people that they are running their breathing machines on electricity they don't have. So empathy is important. And it's important because I do believe that the American dream the, in the 21st century, the new American dream in the 21st century should be providing for yourself. You should care about yourself, about your family, about your children, about your house, about your land. But I do believe the new American dream is also making sure that others less fortunate than us have the same options to provide for their families. That's the new American dream. Take care of yourself, but make sure you are taking care of those you don't know. That's the only wall I can think of. That's the wall I want to leave for my three daughters, and I'm sure every one of you. I want to leave a wall they feel good and happy and safe and respected. And to do that is provide the same for everybody else, not only for your own. That's our constitution is three words I love, guys. We, the people. And we, the people means we, the people, no I, the person. When we become a nation of we, the people, nothing can stop us. If we become a nation of I, the person, quite frankly, things are going to go wrong more than not. We cannot be selfish because we understand that what is good for me must be good for others. That's the only way forward. So all of your efforts uh, have combined to create the World Central Kitchen. Tell us more about it specifically, how you launched it, and how others can help. So, so World Central Kitchen happened, uh, it's been many parts of my life. I, I think the first book I ever read in English that I kind of think I understood was John, uh, John Steinbeck. Uh, I love him, and, uh, and uh, one of the books, The Grapes of Wrath, said towards the end of the novel, whatever there is a fight so hungry people may eat, I will be there. Kind of, I took that to, for granted. Um, my first restaurant in DC, 1993, was Haleo, my Spanish restaurant, which by the way, I have one here in Vegas. Uh, that's a commercial. <laughs> and I have three others. That's a commercial too. And, and the house across the street from my restaurant was a beautiful red brick house and had a sign on the front that says, the missing soldier's office. Anybody has a clue what this is? That's fine, I forgive you. This was the house that a great woman with a lot of empathy and a lot of love for the fellow citizens, created this amazing system to take care of the wounded 
uh, soldiers during the Civil War. Her name was Clara Barton. Clara Barton was a woman that very much created the American Red Cross in the early days. That to me, a woman, a nurse, was able to create such an amazing system to take care of the wounded during the Civil War when there was no system to take care of Americans in pain. To me, it's amazing. With nothing, she created everything. So those things were very important. But then, in 1993, I met Robert Egger, a good friend. He founded an NGO called DC Central Kitchen. He took homeless out of the streets, ex-convicts, cleaned them, found them a job, a place to, to live, cleaned them from any issue they had, from addiction, addictions they had, and then trained them during uh, 21, 22 weeks to become cooks. And then we'll graduate them, and in the process, restaurants like me, we will hire them. Very often we talk about wasting food. Lately you use about waste food, and we should not waste food. Almost we never talk about wasting people. We should be in the business of making sure that no human life is wasted. We should all do more to make sure no human life is wasted. And so we need to find ways to give opportunity to those that maybe didn't have the same opportunity I got. So in the process, we will feed 10, 12,000 people a day. So imagine, we had a problem, homeless, and we transformed it into an opportunity. We gave them jobs, and we gave them a reason why they deserve to belong to America. And being really, really good citizens, being part of rebuilding their lives, and in the process, rebuilding the communities they live. In the process, again, we feed millions of meals a day. I arrived there like a young cook, volunteer. I became the chairman. But Robert Agar was always a very important person in my life in that sense. Robert told me one phrase that to this day, I keep it very close to my heart and my brain. But he said that charity seems is always about the redemption of the giver when charity should be about the liberation of the receiver. Think about that phrase. We should be giving to the betterment of lives of others, not just to redeem ourselves, but we should be doing it to liberate those that receive our aid and we help them to be in a better place. So that for me was super important and that was very much the beginning. Everything else, Haiti happened, I landed there after the earthquake in 2010, I began cooking, and there is where I saw that was not real organizations that in big, big chaos will come and take care of feeding. And I wanted just to have this organization that will find these kind of possibilities to serve others with one plate of food at a time. I met these guys uh, from Southern Baptist Church I don't know if you've seen them, but the Southern Baptist Church, they are super well organized. Many times when you hear that Americans are being fed by the Red Cross, it's actually the men and women of these different chapters of the Southern Baptist Church. And I began watching them at work in different parts, in New York after Sunday, and the work they do was amazing. What happened, they were used normal folks doing an amazing work. I mean, I thought, let me, let me contribute to what they are doing because they cannot handle everything and create an organization based on what they are doing, which is gather the troops, gather the cooks, find the food, find the kitchens, start cooking, and then start delivering the food. So that's very much how, how we began World Central Kitchen. A very simple idea. Let's make sure that anybody after a natural disaster that needs a plate of food, that is going to happen, and so those men and women don't have to worry about feeding their families so they can be taking care of everything else. Yes, Q&A. Uh, how much time, Sarah, do we have? Is this, with this time? We can keep going. Oh, I have so many stories. So it's pretty telling. Some people we... there, they think I'm about to start cooking. I'm, I'm sorry. But we could. How many you are? So it is pretty telling that we've been up here for over 20 minutes, and we, we even though you've referenced food, you know, we haven't talked a lot about it. So talk about 
what is important about where you source your food, how you source your food um, at, for all of your restaurants? Well, uh, well you know, food is, is a very interesting one today, right? Because lately it's a lot about the local and the seasonal. And I think that's something I embrace, but you have to embrace it in a very pragmatic way. Why? Because it's local and seasonal, and my wife likes avocados, and she lives in Washington. It's not avocados in Washington. So I am guilty because I'm bringing avocados from Mexico, so my wife can have her breakfast of avocados every morning. I mean, you tell me. So the conversation has to be pragmatic. If not, we are all nuts. And now even more, that if they build the, bo the wall, what are we going to do? Where the avocados are going to come through if we have a wall? The good thing about the avocados is that it's a very good fruit that you can send over throwing. And it's amazing that America loves baseball because we can have baseball throwers. So I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. We're going to still have avocados. But now in a serious note, we need to be pragmatic. Right now, I'm bringing these amazing clementines from Ojai, California. Anybody here from Ojai or nearby? It's an amazing place. I had to go there because the farmer wouldn't send me his clementines. Yeah, Lisa, I mean, tough cookie. Because she likes to sell them locally. And I'm like, Lisa, but these planes coming from LA to DC every day, that's a mother, you put me two boxes there. Come on, be nice. I took my entire family there to work with them on the field, so they will send me those clementines during two weeks every year. And I swear to God, they're so good. They're so expensive, but they're so good. So again, you know, the conversation on local, I think for me is very important, that we need to be pragmatic. Because I have sometimes people lecturing me about local, oh, Jose, you know, it's like, I have a Spanish restaurant. What, what do you want me to give you? Manchego from Spain or Manchego from Wisconsin? I love the cheeses of Wisconsin, but I have them in my American restaurant. If I have a Spanish restaurant, I have to bring my cheese from, from Spain. And they tell me, but uh, it's coming from so far away. I'm like, well, it's six hours from Spain to DC as it's six hours from LA to DC. I mean, pragmatism has to win the day. Let me give you one thing about one thing I, I fall in love uh, with American cooking. I have a restaurant called America Eats, and for many years I began collecting recipes, going back to the beginning of America uh, and beyond, on, on, on what American cooking really was. And I learned that we've forgotten many things. One of the first early ketchups were oysters. And now you don't find oyster ketchup anywhere. Many of the ketchups were made of blackberries and some fruits. You don't find any more ketchups made of those early recipes. It's many cookbooks from 1700s that they refer to those ketchups. None of them were tomato. So for me, it's very important that sometimes we bring those recipes out from being forgotten because they were part of the making of what America is today. But then one day my daughter came she was 12, and she tells me, Daddy, do you like pow pows? And I'm like, what? Pow pows. I'm like, oh, yeah. There's like papaya. Like, no, no, no. Pow pow. It's an American ingredient. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's this tree that grows all in Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania, all the way to Ohio. Lewis and Clark fed on pow pows before they came back from the West to tell us about everything they saw. And then I learned that pow pows were the most American fruit that American was not aware of. And, and, and I learned this from my 10 year old daughter. Now I bought 100 pow pow trees. I gave them to a local farmer. Uh, this year we had our first pow pow harvest. But then I just realized it's so much we don't know. And we should be in the business of knowing that to me we have this fruit that is called pow pow that is so genuinely American, but somehow for different reasons has not made it into the mainstream. 
to me is fascinating. This tells me that there's more opportunities out there than we think. The persimmons. We have persimmons in Asia, persimmons in Europe, but America has persimmons that somehow they are almost forgotten. Um, I'm in the business of trying to help bringing those persimmons around the area I live because for some reason they disappear and they should be brought back because they are the essence of the DNA of what the American forest is. No? So I am in the business in, in number one, being pragmatic. Local is very important. We need to support our local economies. It's okay to buy from Amazon, but then don't complain that every store in your little town is closing down. You cannot be complaining of that, but then don't support in that. You want your local economies to do well, support your local economies. Use, if it's raining, I'm sorry, get wet and go to the farmer's market. Again, I said before, we need not only to talk and preach, but also to do. You will see me in every farmer's market every single Sunday, especially if it rains. And I will do a tweet to try to bring people. Because the, farm, the farmer's market is empty on a cold, rainy day in Washington. But those farmers wake up anyway at 4 a.m., they drive for two hours, they set the shop, and they are there waiting for us. If I want to have a good, thriving community in Washington or on any other state in the union, we need to be supporting those people that they are having a big effort to create the DNA of who we are. That's why we need to be always supporting these things. It's okay to buy from Amazon and we should not feel guilty. But we should find pragmatism in what's the right measure. If you have something you can buy locally and only you have to walk or use five minute drive, you're gonna be making a big difference in your community only by doing that small gesture. And sometimes our local economies can improve 10 times if every one of us commit to making sure that our local economies are prosperous. In the process of helping our local economies, we are helping America as a whole. I have nothing else to say about that. Our, my last question before we turn things over to the audience and take uh, their questions. You referenced your restaurants here in Vegas. Tell us more about those. So I have five. Uh, Jaleo, Spanish, tapas. I remember 25 years ago, I would tell people I work in a tapas restaurant and they will tell me, who are you, the bouncer? <laughs> I'm like, excuse me, I'm a Christian boy, what are you talking about? So yeah, tapas people, tapas, not the other thing. Um, I have, <laughs> that, that happened, that's not a joke. Um, yeah, I was a big boy and they thought, yeah, you're a good bouncer. Said, no, no, I'm the cook. Um, China Poblano, which is Chinese Mexican, which is crazy, but works. You can have your dim sum next to your margarita, your guacamole next to your wonton soup. Is this town in Mexico called Mexicali. And this was all these Chinese that work at the railroad, first in California and then in Mexico. And then these poor guys, they do the work and then they wanna kick them back. And many of them, they wanna go back to China. We we're talking 1800, 1900s early. And they move into the desert and they create this little community. And now you go there and you can find tacos and taco, tacos and noodles in the same street. So me, I, I wanted just to tell that story of Chinese meets, China meets Mexico. Then I have one called Bazaar Meat, which is the best meat house in the history of mankind. Yes, I am being pretentious about it. But if I'm not pretentious about that, who is gonna be? It's a heck of a good place. We have meats from different states, from, from Texas and from California, and from North Carolina and all the places. And our meats are amazing. Actually, I'm very proud because with these two women in California, they had these old milking, milk cows that then after they don't produce more milk, they will slaughter them and they will be. But I realized that those old cows were are actually very good. So we fed them more grain and more grass until they were even bigger. We stopped milking them, so we gave them vacation for some time. Yeah, 
sorry. And, and those cows are unbelievable. It's the best steak you'll have in your entire life. I mean, it's like dunking a steak in milk. I mean, I know it may sound gross, but it's actually amazing. I mean, you think about it. If a donut is good, milking it in, in, in a donut in milk, imagine a steak. It, it like, it's, like, it's like that. It changes your life. So that's bizarre meat, and I love it. We have one of the biggest grill systems ever. And then I have one called E, which is only eight seats. Um, I would not say it's super expensive. It's only like you have, you know, like 16 people working for eight of you at the time. It's a tasting menu of 30 courses, and it's amazing. I have three, one in LA, one in DC, and one here in Vegas. So those are the restaurants I have now here in Vegas. So, so you don't have to go to them, but if you go, thank you for going. That, that was tell our, them that we know you now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell them you know me. Uh, tell them what did he say? Uh, yeah, you tell them Jose told me to take good care of me. All right. Yeah. So we are at the Sahara and at the Cosmopolitan. So is the two latest casinos. Um, here in, in Vegas, so very, very, very happy. You, if you go, you'll have fun. But then I'm in Miami, I'm in LA, I am in, in, in Bahamas, actually I have a restaurant there now. I am in, uh, in New York, I am uh, in Washington, and yeah, more places coming. So if you're good for it, we're gonna open yeah. up questions. So for those of you who do have a question, uh, either raise your hand or uh, Any questions? Stand up. They have mics? Do they have mics? They will have mics. We have two gentlemen that will come to you if you would like to add. I mean, this guy knows everybody. Okay, here we go. All right. I, I always learn so much when I listen to you. Thank you. I have a quick factoid and then a question. I, I love that you talked about monarch butterflies and that they're dependent on milkweed. You also talked about pawpaws. Did you know that the zebra swallowtail is dependent on pawpaws? Wow. Just like the monarch is dependent on milkweed, it's the only food that the juvenile can eat. It's essential for its reproduction, and it's in trouble. So thank you for advancing thank pawpaw you. Paw production. You, you know I found um, the archivist uh, who runs the National Archives. Um, he used to be the, the archivist uh, or the librarian at Duke University, a great guy. And he saw my love for pow pows. He went into the National Archives and he found a peace treaty between the United States and the Northern Indian tribes. And the peace treaty was that the Indian tribes were going to be getting all the pow pows forests. So anyway, I thought that's an amazing fact. I don't think we've gave enough uh, importance to pop but I love them. I'm, I only hope, I know Ohio has a good production, uh, but you know, I hope we're gonna do more research to make sure that pow pow becomes a true American ingredient that everybody knows. I mean, some state should change their flag and put a pow pow in the flag. <laughs> I mean, we put other things in the flag that they don't even, belong to us, the pow pow deserves to be in the flag of one of the states. So yeah, I, I, I know some people are gonna say, now this immigrant wants to change the flag of the states. Yeah, I'm only requesting one state to have a pow pow in their flag. <laughs> what the pow pow has done to us? Nothing, they're good people. <laughs> they're quiet in the forest. And, and, and those animals feed on them. So man, something happened with pow pow. I don't know what happened. But we need to protect pop pops. My, my question is really of looking for advice. Chefs, or as you put it, cooks, are the spokespeople for food. They give voice to food. How do we, as a conservation community, engage that community to be the voice for clean water, healthy soils, through food? This is a great question. I think. I think definitely we have to do more. You need to understand that chefs like me, like the type of restaurants we do, we are a very small percentage of all the restaurants that feed America. I think chefs like us, because we may have a voice, is very important, and I can tell you one thing. 
every chef I know is ready to engage you. So probably we're gonna have to find a way here to have really this kind of group of chefs that come and can interact with you more, you know, in a more conscious way. We have chefs like Nora Puyon. Nora in Washington DC was the first chef that got the first restaurant ever 100% organic. The other chef we know well is Alice Waters in Berkeley. Those are chefs that they have very clear ideas, very powerful ideas of how we should be producing foods. We cannot be producing foods that yes, makes us successful today, but makes us poor 10, 20 years from now. We need to start, as I said before, doing things in a pragmatic way that we can be proud of what we do, that we can provide for our community, for our families, but then in the process, we don't make our communities poorer 10, 20, 30 years because what we are doing, the way we are producing, is not the right sustainable way that keeps damaging the waterways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what you said is the question you are asking is you should take the question out. And what we need to be doing is making sure that folks like you that for so many years, now in 75th anniversary you're celebrating, that, that you bring guys like us so we can join you and become true spokespersons for what you are trying to achieve. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all want, to keep producing today but live a better America for our children. And we can do this one plate of food at a time. We should do this, you should make it happen. I'm not gonna tell you I'm gonna be leading that effort because just we, f we fed 15 million meals in the last two years and I have my hands. But yes, I can be there as one more guy supporting because what we want to do is what you want to do. It's no reason why you should not be talking more together and finding ways really to be making sure that your message is heard across America, in the Senate, in the Congress, and make sure that every bill, every law that we pass is to make a better, a stronger America, one foot at a time, one plate of food at a time. One more question. Yes, sir. In the back. Good morning. I have a double question. First, I'd like to ask you, what do you think about the trend of fake foods, like impossible burgers and everything, and the fact that we're adulterating foods from their natural state? I didn't sign for this. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, if I run one day for Congress, anything I say today can be used against me. <laughs> the, listen to me, I, I've been talking pragmatism. Is number one, we need to be aware and learn and understand everything. In my case, we need only to be thinking on, on uh, if you're talking about those, you, know, you call them fake meats, some people call them use this vegetable, grain-based, meat-like. I only care about one thing. We have seven billion, we're about to have nine billion people before we know, uh, billion on planet Earth. America, we know it's a country, and here you have this responsibility in your shoulders that can and will not only feed America, but export foods to feed many other parts of the world. And if it's a country that can do this in an efficient way, in a clean way, leading the way, that's America. So every one of you in your shoulders, yes, you're running your businesses or your farms or your, and you care genuinely about your communities and about your about, and about your country as it should. But here is this moral responsibility about how you do it, being successful, and in the process, generating wealth in the environment and in the economy of the places you live. And in the process, we have to be taking care of how we're gonna be feeding the world. And we need to show the example so the world can learn from us, 
and do the same things in Africa, in South America, in Asia, and in other places. So with that, what I want to say is this. No, uh, I'm, uh, listen, uh, I, I want to be multi-billionaire one day. <laughs> so I love America and its capitalist system because I had the opportunity to maybe today do better than, uh, tomorrow do better than, I came to America with $50, and today I'm doing OK. But I, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I don't have a private plane. I don't fly in private. If, well, if a friend pays for it, I do, but I don't pay for it. Um, what I'm trying to go is that we, we, we need to do better, but not at the expense of other people doing worse. And we, want to, we need to do better, but not at the expense of the environment doing worse. This we know is not sustainable and is not the way forward. Said that, there's going to be a lot of new things coming up to feed the planet, to feed America. Now we have eggs that they are not made out of animal, that they are made out of proteins coming out of different plants. I don't see a problem with those eggs. Actually, I like them. And it's not what I'm going to have for breakfast, <laughs> but they're OK. So I am in the business of supporting those companies that they're bringing new ideas. Anyway, for those eggs, we're going to need a lot of farmers to be producing a lot of vegetables that out of that you can be taking different proteins to produce those eggs. So this is a good thing because it generates new ways uh, for our farmers in America to be successful by having new crops. So I don't have a problem with that. The only thing I have a problem is when our government doesn't help every one of us to know what's happening in the food that we feed our children. I think we need to be open. We need to be always asking our leaders to make sure that we are not blindfolded, that when we put a spoon of a yogurt or a cheese or a grain or a cereal in the mouth of our children, we 100% know what's going on with that food. So we need to be open. We have to have clarity. And everybody should be informed. That's what you all should be asking. Because America doesn't deserve anything less. And you are the guys that have to make that happen. My second question is much simpler. My grandparents came from Spain, and I want to know, when are you going to open a restaurant in Tampa, Florida? Wow. <laughs> Love Tampa. Um, yeah, I mean, with permission of the of the native uh, Indians here, probably I say the Spanish people we were the first ones to arrive to North America. Well, hold on, I'm with the Vikings too. Yeah, sorry. I don't care. We were first, especially in Florida. Um, and I'm so 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 proud of that. You know, for me, when I came to Pensacola first time. And they celebrate the five flags. Anybody from Pensacola area? Uh-oh. <laughs> the people of Pensacola are great. Well, it's a lot of military in Pensacola, as you know. But they celebrate the five flags. And one of them was the Spanish Castilian flag. And that's the day, I, as I was in the military, I was like, yeah, I belong here. And, and that, to me, gave me, quite frankly, a lot of joy. And as an Spaniard, I've been always learning how many connections between Spain and America that somehow we forgot, uh, especially because the Spanish-American War, I don't know if you know, but Spain and America, we were at war. And, and America kicked the butt of the Spanish Navy. But we are good people, so don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope President Trump doesn't find out and wants to kick me out because we were at war a century ago. <laughs> I don't think so. He's a nice guy. Uh, long story short, uh, as an immigrant, I can say this. I'm a very proud Spanish immigrant, a very proud American immigrant. Um, I'm very proud of what uh, America gave me. And when I became American, they told me that um, I had to contribute back to enrich America with, with the place I came from. And in the process, America enriched me with everything that America means. And, and I don't know if I will open a restaurant in Tampa, but I have one in Orlando, which is close enough. 
Um, and when I was young, I said one day I would have a restaurant in Disney. And I cannot believe that again the American dream happened and I end opening a restaurant next to Mickey Mouse. So. We have time for one more question. One more question. One yes. more question, because they're kicking me out right now. They're calling police. I, I, have, a, I have a question. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. I, Along the lines of the... What, what happened with the people on that side of the <laughs> room? It's only the questions coming from that side of the room. I'm sorry. Guys, we, we need to participate yeah, equally in this democracy, okay? <laughs> Good. Don't worry, I, I got your back. Good morning, thank you for being here. I'm right here. Yep, I we see you. We took the selfie earlier. Wow. My, oh yeah. <laughs> My question has to do with, you've mentioned training chefs and helping people that need to get jobs, etc. In North Carolina, where I live, I live in a very urban area called Charlotte, and the problem that we're confronted with is that a lot of farms in our area have been destroyed by development. There are initiatives that I'm involved with that deal with introducing agriculture as a program within the schools to reintroduce farming as a very vital line of business. You've described an opportunity where you're teaching people on the sort of the end of the food chain where there are chefs. My question and actually my proposal to you is to come to Charlotte and learn about the programs that we're dealing with to help encourage farming because that's where it that's all good. starts. Uh, thank you very much. That's a great initiative. Mm -hmm. I have good news. This is happening all across America. But what we need to do is make sure that this happens really in a powerful way. Um, I've been in Puerto Rico, for example, the way Wall Central Kitchen helped post Hurricane Maria was a lot of small farmers that they were leaving Puerto Rico and they were closing their farms or they were not used rebuilding them because the cost to rebuild them was too great for them. But the banks were not giving them any loans. So young farmers with no ways and means, their destiny was to shut down. We saw an opportunity there. So we began partnering with them and helping them with grants and loans to keep those farms open. We announced with President Clinton Foundation that we were going to be putting four or five million dollars to give these grants and loans to those farmers. Today, I can tell you, we have more than 100 farms in Puerto Rico alone that right now they are open and successfully feeding people in Puerto Rico and creating jobs instead of being closed down and not providing needed food for a place like Puerto Rico. But at the school level, I've been participating in Washington DC in few programs, but I know I'm aware that places like Berkeley, Alice Waters, many other states, Chicago, Miami, that these chefs partnering with local foundations or NGOs, creating these curriculums where the schools become part of the beginning of teaching many children across America the importance of farming itself. At the end, what we are asking is for one thing, because it's a touch. It's a curriculum that can be used one hour a week where children learn about the importance of farming, of producing foods, where the foods come from, how to produce them in the right way. America, at the end of the day, has always been a country of farmers. We need to make sure that farmers have the voice they deserve and they're not put on the side. So if I was you, I would push more for what you're doing it needs to be at the national level. One day Congress is gonna realize that the food that we serve our children in the school is not the right food to be feeding them. And that who should be feeding our children maybe should be directly the farmers. One farmer at the time can be helping one community school district at the time, especially in poor rural areas of America. If we start buying directly through the farm bill that is a lot of money, believe me, going to waste, buying locally, feeding the children in those school districts, hiring local cooks that can be producing those foods for the children, 
In the process, we are feeding our children better. Our children are going to thrive. Our children are going to be healthier. Our farmers are going to be happier because they have a source of income feeding our children and making America stronger, one healthy plate of food at a time. The way forward is a school lunch program that includes our farmers and where the farm bill helps every single one of the small farmers that make this nation an amazing nation. That's what we should be doing, so more of that. Okay, guys, thank you very much. You have big responsibility in your shoulders. The future of America and the future of the world is in your shoulders. And we know we can count on you. Thank you. Thank you so much.